leading our plenary session on artificial intelligence, autonomy, and processing, Commissioner of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, Mr. Gilman Louie. First, I want to thank DARPA for this opportunity to participate in the third annual ERI Summit to discuss AI, national security, and microelectronics on behalf of the National Security Commission on AI. Before I begin, an administrative note. The views or opinions I express today are in my capacity as a commissioner of the National Security Commission on AI. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the entire commission, nor do they reflect the views of any other organization I'm associated with, such as the Defense Innovation Board. I'll start with a brief overview of the NSC AI to familiarize you with our mission. I'll then focus on the commission's approach to microelectronics, highlighting our recent recommendations on hardware and the tremendous response we received from industry, academia, and government. And I'll close with a vision for the future of AI and microelectronics that imagines the impact of DARPA's Electronic Resurgency Initiative, ERI, on not only our national security, but also on our everyday lives. My key message is that the U.S. leadership in microelectronics is essential to U.S. leadership in artificial intelligence. And through programs such as ERI, the United States retains important advantages in AI-related hardware. But we must continue pressing forward urgently across government, industry, and academia to maintain our leadership. As I'm sure you're all aware, the challenges on the horizon are DARPA hard, which means that they require technical feats only DARPA would attempt. Congress established the NSC AI through the 2019 NDAA. We are an independent commission with a three-year mandate to consider methods and means necessary to advance the development of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and associated technologies to comprehensively address U.S. national security. I serve alongside 15 commissioners appointed by Congress and the executive branch with experience in industry, academia, and in government, including our chairman, Dr. Eric Schmidt, and vice chairman, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work. In November last year, we submitted our interim report to Congress on the state of AI for national security. This report affirmed that the United States is in a strategic competition with AI at its center and that the future of our national security and economy are at stake. It calls for new imagination, common purpose, decisive action, and commitment from leaders in government, the private sector, and across society. We also argued that leadership in AI depends directly on leadership in microelectronics. In March, we submitted our first quarter recommendations followed by another package in July. Maintaining U.S. leadership in microelectronics has been the theme of all of our recommendations, and I'll talk more about our work there shortly. The NSC AI believes that we must get AI right for the sake of our national security and economic prosperity, and that we must take meaningful action now. ERI is a great example of bold action to address DARPA hard technological, economic, and national security challenges. Now I'll turn to the Commission's recommendations to date on AI and hardware. We see AI as a four-part stack, consisting of algorithms, data, talent, and hardware. Hardware is critical because AI algorithms increasingly rely on computational power, moving data at high speed. Therefore, U.S. advantages in AI remains tied to U.S. hardware capabilities. Fortunately, thanks to many of the people involved in this summit, the United States has enjoyed strategic advantages in microelectronics since the field's inception. However, this lead is eroding, and the resilience of the U.S. semiconductor supply chain is declining. Building on our interim report, the NSC AI's first quarter recommendations focus on maintaining U.S. leadership in microelectronics, bolstering U.S. 5G capabilities. We made recommendations to support long-term access to resilient, trusted, and assured microelectronics for AI, and took a portfolio approach to running faster than our potential adversaries. 
The commission recommended expanding the U.S. government's novel and resilient sources for producing, integrating, assembling, and testing AI-enabled microelectronics. This includes expanding the Navy-led DOD-wide state-of-the-art heterogeneous integration program, SHIP. Our proposal incorporates an AI hardware demonstration prototype for multi-chip packaging within SHIP. We also recommended stating government-wide priorities for beyond CMOS AI hardware research with national security applications. Underscoring these priorities would focus industry and academia on high-impact research areas, including 3D chip stacking, photonics, carbon nanotubes, gallium nitrate transistors, domain-specific hardware architectures, electronic design automation, and cryogenic computing. To match funding to these priorities, we suggested increasing microelectronics-specific funding for NSF and IARPA. While we propose expanding ERI to $500 million per year, we recognize ERI would take time, potentially two or three DARPA cycles to ramp up and staff up for life after next scale problems. Finally, and potentially most importantly, we recommend that Congress require a national microelectronics strategy. Given this challenge complexity, we need a unified strategic approach to microelectronics across agencies from financial incentives to research goals to export control. We also suggest assessing the viability of a national microelectronics laboratory and incubator. We were encouraged that this recommendation was reflected in the latest House and Senate NDAA version. Since releasing these recommendations, we have appreciated a number of other developments, including efforts to revitalize domestic fabrication of soda microelectronics, such as TSMC's announcements regarding an advanced facility in the United States. Intel's public interest in working with the United States to develop a commercial U.S. foundry and in the introduction of Chips for America's Act, which would substantially bolster U.S. semiconductor manufacturing and research. The CHIPS Act would also expand funding for several programs we identify as essential, including ERI and NSF semiconductor research. Finally, CHIPS Act would establish microelectronic centers of excellence and an incubator mirroring our recommendations. We are indebted to the stakeholders across industry, academia, and government, many of whom are involved with ERI, for informing our interim report and quarterly recommendations. Our goal is to continue crafting recommendations that serve the need of these, this community. In quarter three, we would consider the supply chain and domestic resiliency for advanced semiconductor and AI's associated technology, such as quantum and biotech. We welcome your ideas and hope continuing engaging with you in the future. I've talked about the commission and what we're recommending on hardware. Now I'll discuss the future of AI and microelectronics. Here I'll draw on my experience with the commission as well as my day job as a venture capitalist and my time in the gaming business. First, let's consider the direction of next generation microelectronic capabilities driven by programs under ERI. In the presentations to come, you'll hear from some of DARPA's top PMs who are working at the bleeding edge of AI and microelectronics. Dr. Y.K. Chen would discuss Peach and Hayden. Frank is looking at beyond von Neumann's architectures to achieve breakthrough advances in computing efficiencies and throughput, specifically applications constrained by size, weight, and power, such as edge AI. Peach is exploring ways to reductively scale AI hardware complexity by at least a thousand fold, leading to at least 100x combined reductions in processing latency and power consumption. And Hayden aims to yield at least a 100x reduction in combined computing power th throughput by reducing hardware complexity by retaining high accurate output for deep neural networks. Another presentation by Ted Senator will describe the lifelong learning machine L2M program. L2M is developing next generation advanced AI systems 
capable of learning in real time and applying learning to environments and circumstances not trained in advance. Finally, you'll hear from Dr. Ali K. Shavarzi on Ferro Electronics and DARPA's Dr. Brian Jacobs on quantum inspired algorithms. If these breakthroughs succeed, it will be tremendous for our military advantage, especially in edge AI. But I also want to focus another area of these programs that could be game changing, how we play. Before I found the Incutel, I spent the beginning of my career in the gaming industry. I helped bring Tetris to the United States and develop Falcon, the F-16 simulator series. Most recently, I invested in Niantic, the company that created Pokemon Go and brought augmented reality to the masses. To envision DARPA breakthroughs could reimagine gaming. Consider design requirements for the next generation AR glasses. 3D AR glasses must have a logic element, advanced optics, and display technology, embedded non-volatile memory, AI-enabled algorithms for computer vision, gesture and facial recognition, and sensing, storing, and processing at the edge. This will need to fit in the ergonomic package with low power consumption enabling millions of users across a vast number of devices also presents networking issues, as well as trust and safety concerns. But these challenges are addressable if DARPA succeeds with the programs I described. We can all recognize the role of microelectronics in national security, but we should also think creatively about how these advances can improve everyday lives in the United States and around the world. Gaming is a new version of science fiction that gives our kids the tools to imagine a better future. And we can all imagine the potential of world-scale AR games connecting millions of users. This vision is especially important during the COVID-19 pandemic and home quarantines. Adjusting to our new lives at home has only accelerated the adoption of AR technologies and prompted people to look for new ways to play creatively and virtually. Looking even further out, advances in AI will rely on domain-specific architectures that allow AI to iterate quickly based on synthetic or sparse training data and then deliver data at scale to the edge within fixed response times. We will also need new combinations of algorithms with digital and organic electronics, both of which require our novel interconnects that seamlessly shift between the two. AR is just the beginning. New man-made interfaces will open up unimaginable ways of presenting information and empowering humans with AI. These are just several examples of DARPA hard problems, and I look forward to the next frontiers of microelectronics with ERI leading the way. In closing, we know the challenges ahead, maintaining U.S. leadership in microelectronics. We know that the importance of this challenge to the U.S. national security. Now we must continue the hard work of organizing, coordinating, and resourcing the U.S. government to enable DARPA PMs and other fantastic researchers in academia and industry to continue making breakthroughs that would keep us on the top of microelectronics. This is a critical task, not only for AI and national security, but also for society. On behalf of the entire commission, we appreciate the support of DARPA, as well as ERI's partners in industry and academia. We look forward to continuing to engage you on our quarter three recommendations and final report. Thank you. And now presenting DARPA Microsystems Technology Office Program Manager, Dr. Yangkai Chen. Today, we would like to see uh, a few things uh, MTO is trying to develop uh, to implement the future AI-enabled radio for uh, and the communication for the war fighters. Today's uh, uh, communication system and the radios are really centrally controlled in both battlefield and uh, uh, commercial side. As you can see, and all the youth have to go through a central node to talk to others and uh, route it through a maze of the internet. So the internet can be vulnerable for the uh, traffic congestions or the interruption or attacks. So 
we would like to see uh, what uh, new AI techniques will be able to enable a robust network uh, which will support all the uh, radios and the communications. So what we were imagining is a data-centric autonomous network in the future, which the, uh, each local node will be virtualized and talk to the adjacent nodes to get data rather than going end-to-end -end through the maze. And all the data will be buffered inside the network, so you can fetch the data right away, uh, like you go to the ATM machine rather than go to the real bank to get the money. And uh, to do that, you really like to have an uh, AI-enabled radio, and uh, which can help you to tell what's the communication channel condition and what kind of information you'll be able to get and uh, to process it efficiently at uh, any time, any place, anywhere. So to do this, uh, MTO have uh, four exploratory programs to look at more fundamental things, how can we implement the AI-enabled radio to make it more efficient and uh, uh, fast and uh, consume very low power. So the first topic we talk about is the uh, Hayden. Uh, basically, the Hayden is trying to explore the future uh, data structures and uh, which we use very efficient uh, computation uh, logic and uh, to speed up the latency and uh, also increase the capacity. Uh, uh, this will be illustrated by the talk of Professor Young Rebel from Berkeley uh, later. And the next topic uh, we will be explore will be the edge uh, uh, pitch program and uh, which will try to see how can we enhance the capacity of the edge nodes uh, with very simple uh, computation network uh, instead of the current the DNN, which you need a big cloud center computer to do it, can we do that very efficiently at the edge, for example, like a photonics techniques? So uh, Dr. Sibia Filov uh, Povic uh, will be uh, from Perspecta Lab, will give you uh, some example for this uh, approach. And then the next one will be the Frank program. Frank program is say, if we have all the data, and uh, have to be processed. The current volume architecture has processing unit and the memory separated. So send the data back forth between the computer unit and the memory is a bottleneck. So the Frank program is look at the new computing techniques to compute in memory, which will facilitate a lot of AI algorithms uh, like uh, the Hayden and the Peach uh, can be done efficiently in processing memory. Then the, uh, the last uh, topic is the spin, a uh, simple processing in the neural net. So what we plan to explore is uh, to find a new signal processing by AI techniques to enhance the current communication uh, DSP uh, algorithms and uh, to give more accuracy with much shorter delay. And uh, this one we just studied, so we do not have the uh, speaker uh, to uh, share with you. Uh, hopefully next year we will be able to have more uh, results to present. Uh, so the next speaker uh, to talk about the Hayden is uh, Professor Young Reba from UC Berkeley. Thank you, YK. In this presentation, I would like to explore how high dimensional representations can help to blur the distance between computation and communication. And I will do this using one specific example. We all know that we are getting surrounded in our daily life with a sea of sensors. Those sensors measure activities in the world, the state of the physical environment around us. Now, in a traditional setting, the way we capture this is to have those nodes distributed, um, a set of sensors acquiring data, doing some pre-processing, ultimately followed by some compression, channel coding, and ultimately transmission over wireless link. Since we have multiple devices in the environment, the wireless protocol has to ensure that the data remains orthogonal. At the receiver side, we perform the opposite. We receive the signals from the various sensors, perform some channel decoding, decompression, and ultimately feed this to it the computational engine, a machine learning potentially, that tries to make sense of all the data. 
The challenges of this approach is that it's very layered and hence inefficient. It also has major issues with robustness, against noise, against interference, and resiliency in changing environments. Now, what you have to realize that in the scheme I just basically described, the value is not in the raw data of the individual sensor. The value is really in the composite pattern that emerges from all those sensors. So that's really what you would like to capture in a system like this. So that's why we are proposing an alternative approach where various sensor data on various sensor nodes gets captured and then translated directly into a high dimensional space using an encoder. Each of those sensor nodes transmits those high dimensional vector in superposition over a wireless channel. To a receiver, they can choose to do two things. It either can try to decode the information using iterative fashion, taking the signals apart again. And that's cool, but not really necessary. A more effective way is to perform classification and reasoning directly on the received high dimensional pattern that basically comes from the wireless link. So this approach has a set of advantages. First of all, it presents a single framework that combines all the things together, source and channel coding, transmission with classification and reasoning. Transmission is done in superposition. We put information on top of each other and form composite patterns by that superposition. And finally, because of the high dimensionality, this approach is extremely robust against interference and ultra low signal to noise ratio conditions. Now, in order to explain how this works, it's probably worth spending some time on how high dimensional computing works. Well, high dimensional computing is a statistical processing approach. It doesn't use numbers as its basic operation set or a basic alphabet, but it basically operates on random high dimensional patterns, vectors of lengths that are probably about the dimensionality of a couple of thousand to 10,000. Now, we know that if you basically pick random large dimensional vectors, by nature, they're gonna be pseudo-orthogonal. So we actually start forming a pseudo-orthogonal base right away for our computation to take place in. The other properties of the status of, of uh, HG processing is that it's approximate. You don't have to be deterministically identical. As long as you're similar, you're fine. Thirdly, we actually can perform operations on those patterns. There's actually an algebra with multiplication, addition, permutation that allows us to perform more complex patterns and composite patterns. And we actually can compare them using very simple distance metrics such as a Hamiltonian, uh, 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 such as basically Hamming distance. It supports reasoning as a result, so we can think about the results, we can take them apart again, we can try to understand them. And as I already said, it's built on similarity. So a big role in an environment like this is an associative memory. And it's a memory that can do quick search for good matches. And finally, last property we're gonna use extensively is that HD computation. By putting information on top of each other into a single pattern, computes, stores, and communicates in superposition. Now, us, our group, and Vader Orders group have demonstrated that this approach is very effective and efficient in the domain of spatial-temporal pattern classification and fast learning. And I'll show that with a couple of examples. In the first example, we're performing basically gesture recognition using EMG signals that are gathered on the arm of a, of a body. And uh, the, in this particular case, we use a flexible array of sensors, about 128, gather the data, and then process them, feed, map into the high-dimensional space, combine them into pattern and ultimately store them in our associative memory for comparison and uh, identity check for classification, basically. This can then be used to basically perform, uh, basically implement, for instance, uh, prosthetic arms or to control robot arms or drones or whatever you want to. So what we perform here is classification of spatial temporal sensor streams. It's very accurate, but even more importantly, learning is extremely quick. Once I basically execute a single gesture, we actually can start comparing to it. So it's actually basically one-shot learning. Even better, we can 
it with subsequent gestures, we actually can improve on the learning. So it's in a continuous learning approach. It is very simple and lightweight. It can fit on a small microcontroller as shown in the picture on the left right here. And finally, it is robust. Robust against change, variations, errors, you name it. To demonstrate the concept of uh, computation and supervision a little bit further, let's look at another example. Uh, let's look at the example of a music classifier. We have a song that's represented in the time domain, and we want to figure out if a particular segment is part of it. Now, you could do this using classification in the time domain or on the frequency domain. In our approach, what we do is capture and translate this whole song into simple, a single hyper vector. Now, the way you do that is basically by combining the spatial temporal information into high dimensional vectors, compose them into larger structures, and ultimately add them all together into a single high dimensional vector. That basically represents that particular song. So what we are doing here, as you can see already on the picture on the right here, you see that basically combining things together, we try to extract structure from the raw data that comes in. But in the search space where we look for a particular sub-pattern in Total Song, actually this can be done in a single shot. Uh, it's a search to the whole song using one operation, which basically translates into computation superposition. So that's basically hopefully helps to explain some of the concept of high dimensional computation. Now let's figure out how this works for this scenario we originally envisioned, the distributed sensor uh, uh, classification uh, application. What we've shown so far is indeed it works. We've shown that with high dimensional vectors, I can transmit under extreme low SNR and do it reliably and being capable of reconstructing the data even in the presence of noise levels that are higher than the system, signal itself. Uh, you can trade it off. Obviously, the, the amount of superposition, uh, you can trade off between robustness, the amount of superposition, and the vector length you're operating on. We've also shown that we are extremely robust against interference. If you have a vector length of about 8,000, we can support up to 38 interferers transmitting at the same time and still being capable at the end at the receiver to take those signals apart effectively. Now, that's not really what you want to do in this particular case. We actually would like to classify them directly on the data. But if you want to, we actually can show you can take the data apart again. And the way you do that is by iterative decoding. Actually, if data basically is superimposed, using the orthogonality features of the various HD subspaces, we can effectively take signals apart again and reconstruct them as is shown in this video, where a composite scheme with some characters in different colors and different positions is taken apart iteratively into its individual components and has done so effectively and, um, and, and efficiently. Now, finally, you may ask yourself, well, is operation on vectors of length of 10,000, is that not extremely expensive? And the answer is not really, because the operations are really simple they're very pipelined and local bit level operations. So there's no global signals whatsoever. So very nice pipeline systolic engine can basically do this very effectively. And um, obviously an important role is played by the memories, especially the associative memory where search is basically implemented. We've shown <coughs> using CMOS uh, realized in 28 nanometers that this whole thing, that, that using this approach we can perform a set of benchmark, classification benchmark, at energy levels of about one microjoule per prediction or classification, which is extremely low. So what's next? Well, ultimately, obviously, we would like to demonstrate that distributed wireless situational awareness system. That's something we're currently actively working on, on the single scheme where HG communication and computation are embracing each other to perform and basically create extremely efficient system implementations. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. I am Sylvia Filipovic, a senior research scientist at Prospecta Labs. I will present uh, our approach to compact and low latency AI hardware for training and inference at the edge using the application of specific emitter identification as an example. 
our system uh, is called the DLR, which is a Deep Delay Loop Reservoir Computer. Let me introduce the motivating application for DLR, which is RF fingerprinting for authentication in IoT. Uh, we know that electronic devices have fingerprints, those uh, non-linearities and imperfections that are created during the manufacturing process. Uh, RF emitters also have such fingerprints. Uh, specific emitter identification, or SEI, exploits those fingerprints to distinguish one RF device from another. We now have uh, the IoT with no real infrastructure for billions of small and diverse devices exchanging uh, mostly short messages. And uh, such a quantum leap uh, in the internet concept uh, will introduce uh, many uh, cybersecurity vulnerabilities, including authentication and tracking of devices. Uh, SCI can be useful here. It performs passive authentication, which is much more secure than MAC addresses, and it also can completely eliminate uh, the source address in the packet header which in predominantly short IoT packets decreases the overhead substantially and therefore increases the throughput. So SCI is useful, but uh, the state-of-the-art training requires big servers and there is no in-situ real-time tra training. DLR offers a solution. It allows, allows for ad hoc choice of the devices to identify and track by easy, fast, on the order of a couple of seconds, low swap retraining at the edge. It is also amenable to a compact deployment at mobile devices. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we illustrated this application uh, in situ authentication and tracking of ad hoc devices uh, by presenting the uh, Internet of Things as some of the household devices uh, that are in the range of a DLR device acting here as an IoT edge security server. So in the case uh, uh, of an attack where the attacker spoofs the MAC address of a legitimate uh, IoT household device, uh, the DLR can identify uh, the spoofing and uh, based on the RF signature and uh, block such a device. So how does it work? Uh, the DLR uh, uses uh, uh, the loop reservoir that replaces the delay loop reservoir that replaces the end neurons in the traditional space, spatial implementation of the reservoir uh, with the end passes through a single neuron. Then the end fold increase in the delay by the sequential passing of the data through a single neuron is cancelled out by, the, by an end fold upsampling done by a random spreading sequence. With the reservoirs, the end must be large, and uh, uh, such high rate upsampling is amenable to a photonic loop implementation, which DLR utilizes. Uh, as a result, uh, the high and the large N allows the reservoir to linearly separate uh, the classes, devices in this case, and uh, allows, makes uh, learning very easy. So there is no need for the cloud. On the right hand side, uh, we present uh, the authentication in three easy steps. First, the training, which starts with a data point. Uh, we know that uh, RF waveforms are two-dimensional. We have amplitude and phase, and in this case, uh, we have about 200 two-dimensional uh, uh, samples, which is equivalent to uh, a burst uh, uh, of about one microsecond. So this is the point one marked with one here, the entrance to DLR, and from this point, we can uh, go to uh, uh, typical conventional uh, 
training by a, a deep neural network such as RNN or residual network, or uh, we can uh, spread each sample of the uh, data point uh, by n times and feed it into a loop or multiple, multiple loops depending on the architecture, uh, which results in a state vector uh, x hat uh, marked by 2 uh, in our uh, picture. And when all data points are transformed into uh, state vectors, uh, then we feed uh, the state vectors into a rich regression um, classifier, actually train the uh, uh, weight coefficients of the rich regression classifier based on the state vectors. And once we have the trained uh, uh, matrix W out for every new data point X sub N, we just uh, uh, spread it, uh, put it through the loop, and then we get uh, uh, to multiply with uh, W out and get the ID in three simple steps, which uh, happens in a fraction of a millisecond. So how, how does it pairs with state of the art uh, based on the example of uh, uh, SEI for 20 Wi-Fi uh, devices? Uh, the state of the art here is uh, deep neural nets, both uh, ResNet and recurrent neural net. And uh, uh, on the left hand side, uh, we uh, show a visual comparison through confusion matrices where in the middle you have the, uh, our approach, DLR, residual computer plus ridge regression. Uh, left from here, you have the ridge regression only, so there's no reservoir. And obviously, uh, 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 lower accuracy uh, based on the confusion matrix. And on the right-hand side is the confusion matrix for the reservoir uh, for the residual network after one hour of training, which is similar to uh, our accuracy. Uh, but uh, we train in uh, about three seconds, which gives us uh, the latency reduction figure of merit of about 1200. Uh, we present other figures of merit too in the uh, table on the right, uh, including a uh, hardware complexity reduction uh, form, which is uh, basically the ratio of uh, the number of multiply and accumulate operations uh, for a recurrent neural network versus DLR, uh, 100, and a spatial reduction form, which is the ratio of the number of parameters used for the RNN versus DLR, which is about 20. Overall, uh, the total hardware reduction, reduction factor is larger than 2K in the training phase and uh, the same for the, uh, or similar for the inference phase. Uh, you can see that uh, we uh, matched and uh, exceeded the accuracy of the state-of-the-art uh, network. Now, uh, we have this uh, uh, picture of our lab prototype uh, that shows the RF front end, then some FPGA logic performing the pre-processing of the RF uh, samples. And then we have uh, a switch that allows us to either use a digitally implemented reservoir loop uh, or uh, the photonic implementation of the loop. So, two selectable DLR implementation, FPGA-based and uh, photonics-based. Uh, our photonic loop is currently being calibrated and uh, the results that we just presented to you are based on the FPGA, FPGA implementation of the loop. Uh, using the photonic loop, uh, we can uh, increase uh, uh, the sampling rates and uh, which uh, can lead towards the miniaturization uh, with an ASIC uh, of the size of a, a silver dollar, approximately. And we can also uh, scale the, uh, the capacity through wa wavelength, time, and spatial multiplexing.
thank you for your attention. Uh, here are the members of our team, including uh, uh, my colleagues from Perspecta Labs and from our subcontractor, Concurrent TDA. Let me start off by saying it's an honor to present at the 2020 ERI Summit. I will talk about our UCLA team's efforts in enabling artificial intelligence in edge devices. As we all know, AI and machine learning applications require computations with large models. The amount of on-chip memory currently available is simply insufficient for such large models. As a result, data has to be constantly ferried back and forth between the processors and external DRAM. This results in high energy consumption and poor latency. This is an obstacle in the wide adoption of AI in resource-constrained edge devices, such as the radios that Dr. Chen described earlier. Current neuromorphic uh, approaches based on memristors and flash, they offer a very low energy and latency. However, they tend to be point solutions that do not scale well beyond the simplest AI applications and datasets. In contrast, GPU, TPU, or digital accelerator-based solutions are programmable and scalable. However, they consume far too much energy and latency to be of much use in such resource-constrained devices. Our goal is to enable AI in edge devices that is simultaneously energy efficient, fast, and perhaps more importantly, programmable and scalable to a larger set of AI applications. Our approach is based on two key complementary ideas. First, we will be developing a new Spintronics memory called Magnetoelectric RAM or MERAM. MERAM is a high density, low energy, non-volatile memory technology that can be integrated onto standard CMOS fabrication processes. This greatly reduces the need to move model data off chip. It also reduces the cost of moving memory on chip. The second part of our approach is called stochastic computing. This uses uh, an unconventional random number uh, representation. This unconventional number representation uh, miniaturizes the basic computational units. Uh, as a result, the compute can be massively parallelized and further reducing the amount of data movement. Together, we expect up to two orders of improvement in energy or latency. Furthermore, our completely digital stochastic computing approach means that it will be both programmable and it will scale to a larger set of AI applications. Let's take a closer look at our approaches. Now, magnetic memory is not new. The basic device is a magnetic tunneling junction device uh, the tunneling junction is sandwiched between a free and a fixed magnetization layers. The a bit is written into the device by controlling the magnetization of the free layer. What is unique about our approach is that we use an electric field that is an applied voltage to control the magnetization of the free layer. This is called voltage controlled magnetic anisotropy or VCMA effect. The VCMA effect allows us to use small access transistors and low write currents. Accordingly, MERAM offers lower energy, higher density and much lower latency than state of the art such as spin transfer torque or STT RAM. We have already demonstrated these benefits in hardware in individual devices. Currently, we are in the process of CMOS integrating uh, larger magnetic, uh, ma magnetic RAM arrays. Uh, simulations suggest that uh, 6 to 10x lower energy and latency is achievable with this MERAM arrays compared to STT RAM. The VCMA effect also allows us to generate true random numbers with stable statistics. A long voltage pulse causes the magnetization of the free layer to process down to a relaxed state. 
the magnetization then jumps randomly to a 1 or a 0 state with equal probability. The bias of the random number so generated is fairly stable and not overly sensitive to device or circuit properties such as pulse widths and so on, unlike in STT based devices. The VCMA based random number generator allows us to generate a lot of random numbers with high density and low energy. This is going to be very useful to our stochastic computing, which is the other part of our approach. Of course, uh, random numbers have obvious uses in many, many security and privacy applications as well. We have already demonstrated using wire bonded CMOS and magnetic tunneling junction die uh, that the VCMA based true random number generator passes the battery of NIST randomness tests. The other key aspect of our approach is stochastic computing. This approach represents numbers by the average of random bit streams. This unconventional representation uh, allows us to dramatically reduce the footprint of the basic computational unit, such as uh, the multiply and accumulate or a MAC unit. For instance, our stochastic MAC unit is 250 times smaller than a comparable 8-bit fixed point version. Such tiny Macs allow us to massively parallelize the computation with attendant um, energy and latency benefits. We have already reported 30% uh, lower energy and 16 times lower latency for accuracy comparable to an 8-bit fixed point implementation. Furthermore, our completely digital technique Digital architecture means that it is both programmable and scalable to a large set of AI applications. There is another crucial benefit. The computation accuracy improves progressively on the same hardware simply by using longer bit streams. This means that the AI inference accuracy can be traded gracefully with energy and latency on the same hardware during runtime. We believe this is particularly uh, useful in edge devices which often operate under very tight and time varying resource constraints. In summary, we are developing a solution to the memory bottleneck problem in AI hardware. Our approach is a complementary combination of uh, device development, circuit design, and digital architectures. The research is performed primarily by a group of excellent graduate students and postdocs under the supervision of my colleague, Professor Kang Yang and Professor Kunit Gupta and myself. We thank DARPA and the government for the opportunity to both do this research and present it at this ERI summit. Thank you. Next up, DARPA, Defense Sciences Office Program Manager, Mr. Ted Senator. Hello. I'd like to tell you today about our work in lifelong learning systems, both what we're currently researching and a vision for how we might move forward in the future. Before I do that, I'd like to provide some context about DARPA's investments in our overall strategy in artificial intelligence. In the early days, in the 1960s through the 1980s, AI was characterized by handcrafted knowledge and handcrafted problem solving. It relied heavily on people, and people came up with the representations that were used. So techniques of expert systems and case-based reasoning characterized this era. In the 1990s, we moved on to machine learning type techniques. We had statistical relational AI, uh, we had other types of machine learning, and then later in the 2000s and 2010s, deep learning became a technique that became very popular and very successful. However, in deep learning, we do not specify the representations. The representations are learned, and they're often not something that's understandable by people. They're not necessarily causal. The machine learning error is characterized by correlative models. 
And most important, they don't take advantage of what people already know. And that means that we end up with, with um, systems that require massive amounts of training data, which in many domains are not available. So DARPA's third wave in AI, which emphasizes contextual reasoning, aims to combine the best of both, to use human knowledge to make things understandable, to use what we know, but to update it with real-world data. And that's what we're trying to do in lifelong learning. We're also trying to move beyond it, as you'll see in the next slide. So traditional, so the way machine learning works today is a system is trained, usually in the laboratory. It's then put out in the field where it continues. And because the world changes, its performance can degrade significantly when something is different in the world, when it gets a new task or the world environment changes. What we'd like to do in lifelong learning is do what people do, where we learn from all of our experience, and because we learn, we get better at not only the tasks that we've seen previously, but also new and different tasks. We figure out what it is we need to know and how to apply it and do it in the context. That's the problem we're addressing in our current Lifelong Learning Machines program, which you'll hear more detail about momentarily. Before I do that, though, let me give you a vision for the future, which is that in our current Lifelong Learning program, we are thinking of the paradigm of individual agents that learn. We see in the future a vision of large numbers of agents that learn together. So this is not a particular agent that gets, has many instances and gets customized for a particular user. Rather, it's something like a fleet of autonomous vehicles or a set of many, many uh, machines that were identical when they left the factory but get used in different environments or a set of appliances that are deployed or that are sold to many different consumers. And one wants each of them to learn not only the specifics of their own user and their own environment, but to be able to share what they learn and update it. And the way this is done now is they send all their information back to a central place, and maybe every three months or six months, a new ver software version is distributed to all of, the, all of the instances, all of the machines, all of the vehicles. We envision that each machine will learn its, its individual custom areas, but also be able to share the experiences with each other. Uh, we'll also have issues of size, weight, and power. So this will involve new, uh, new uh, chips, new ways of supporting the local learning, and there'll be a balance between what's learned locally, what's learned and has to be customized without, with taking advantage of the general knowledge that all of the different instances of these agents have. So within coming back to our lifelong learning program, we spent the first phase of the program working on some of the basic ideas with our different agents. In the second phase of the program, which is kicking off around now, we have five system groups which are integrating and demonstrating and then evaluating a number of the ideas that have resulted from the first phase of the program. So it's my pleasure now to introduce that Dr. Eric Eaton from the University of Pennsylvania, who will give an overview of the work in one of the system groups. Thank you. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about our work on lifelong learning of perception and action in autonomous systems. This work was funded under the DARPA Lifelong Learning Machines, or L2M, program. I like starting off with the following quote by Rich Sutton, the grandfather of reinforcement learning. Lifelong learning is the ultimate big data problem, and I'll be showing you some of our progress toward it in this presentation. Imagine that we have some autonomous service robots operating in a university environment, and in order to be able to act effectively, they must be able to recognize objects in that environment, things like staplers and books and monitors and other types of objects that you might encounter in the university. Now let's look at how traditional machine learning would tackle this problem. We would first gather a bunch of images of staplers as examples, and then we would train the model for recognizing staplers by feeding this data through an independent machine learning algorithm, which would then output the model. Now, if we did this for another task, let's say recognizing books, we would follow exactly the same process. We gather up a bunch of different data, feed that data through a learner, and produce the model. Now notice that these two pipelines are completely separate. Traditional machine learning learns each of these tasks in isolation from each other. 
Transfer learning, which was investigated under a previous DARPA program around 2006, provides one potential remedy to this problem. Let's examine the same objective of learning to recognize both staplers and books. If we learn these sequentially, the agent would start by training a model to recognize staplers following the exact same process as before. But now it differs. To train the second model, we no longer need to gather extensive images of books. We could take a limited number of training examples of books, then combine that data with knowledge that was learned on staplers, and the resulting model would then integrate aspects from both previously learned knowledge on staplers adapted to be able to recognize books. This transfer learning process allows previously learned knowledge to improve performance on a new task. With the robot back in the university environment, it already knows about staplers, books, monitors, and now it encounters a new task, like office plants. And so we can use transfer to train up a model for this quickly. But the robot would not be limited to just these objects. It would be expected to learn about other objects, like water fountains and tables and chairs and backpacks and other objects that would be found around a university. And then we might take that robot and move it into a completely different environment, like a hospital, where now it encounters things like wheelchairs and walkers and beds and privacy curtains and patient monitors and other types of objects that it never would have encountered in a university. And then we might move the robot to another environment and another and another. And just like you or I, lifelong machine learning would enable the agent to continually build upon its knowledge over time, enabling it to rapidly learn tasks and improve with experience. This would bring a dramatic new capability to machine learning systems, enabling them to be deployed for extended periods of time in an environment and to learn to handle a diverse variety of tasks over time. This work on lifelong machine learning is bringing a number of different innovations, and I'm gonna go over just a few. The first is this idea of how do you learn a bunch of diverse tasks continually while you're in an environment. In order to do this while you're deployed for a long duration, there's a big issue of maintaining this knowledge over time. So how do you do that in a scalable way? How do you retire outdated knowledge while maintaining your current knowledge in anticipation of future tasks? How do you, do you then take this and reuse this knowledge effectively? Reuse might be most effective when knowledge is captured as a bunch of reusable modular components, each of which represents a cohesive chunk of knowledge. This would then allow them to be effectively combined together to solve tasks. One aspect that is constant is change. So how do you handle non-stationarity in the environment? How do you adapt to change? There are changes both within individual tasks, such as how the process for making a phone call has changed over time. And there are changes within the distributions of tasks, such as how the set of tasks you do today might be very different from five or 10 years ago. And finally, how do you do all of this while ensuring safety, both in terms of transferring knowledge to new tasks, as well as exploring what is possible within the environment? Now let's take a look at how lifelong machine learning works. We have here a lifelong learning machine. As you can see in the upper left, it has already seen tasks T minus one, T minus two, T minus three, and so forth. And from those previous tasks, it has accumulated a bunch of knowledge, which it stores in a repository as seen in the center bottom of the slide. Now we're on a new task, in this case, task T, highlighted in yellow. The system gets a limited number of percepts for task T, either labeled instances in the case of supervised learning or trajectories in the case of reinforcement learning. The lifelong learner would then use this data in order to identify chunks of knowledge from the repository that may be of use for this task. And what it does is combines these together with a limited number of data from the current task. Now this is just a transfer learning step where these identified chunks of knowledge transformed as needed are then combined together with the limited percepts on task T in order to train up a model for task T. The specific model would depend on the application, but this framework can support a wide variety of models such as shallow models for logistic regression or deep learning models such as convolutional neural networks. It can also support a range of reinforcement learning algorithms to produce policies for acting within the environment. Now, what we've shown so far is just a transfer learning process, but lifelong learning adds the next key steps. Now that we've learned these models, we may have a brand new knowledge that we've never seen before that we want to store for future use. 
we might also have refined existing chunks of knowledge that we want to push back into the repository. These two aspects are then stored and made available for future tasks. And so, over time, lifelong learning enables this continual accumulation of knowledge in the repository and the transfer it, of it to rapidly learn each consecutive new task. Now, this process forms the core of a lifelong machine learning uh, framework, and our work takes this idea and expands it out in several important directions. The first is that we're not only focusing on methods that learn a single type of learning task, but we're interested in integrating different types of learning tasks together. Our framework is able to support combinations of reinforcement learning, classification, and regression all interleaved together as different tasks. Consequently, our knowledge base must be a lot more sophisticated. This knowledge base also needs to represent these components of knowledge at different granularities, enabling knowledge to be transferred to a new task at the most appropriate level of abstraction. The second aspect is we want to be able to transfer to a brand new domain that we've never seen before and autonomously map the knowledge that we've already acquired to it. In order to do this, we might have intrinsic goals, which are generated automatically by the system's curiosity, seeking out different things to learn in that environment. And we also might have extrinsic goals that are given by the user as, a, uh, as the mission for the agent to accomplish. Now the agent operates in a dynamic environment, and so we also need to track changes in the task and the task distribution. This allows the agent to determine which tasks are current and which tasks are outdated so that it can retire the corresponding knowledge. And then finally, we give the agent some amount of control over the learning sequence through curriculum selection. This allows the agent to intelligently choose the tasks and the order in which it learns them in order to optimize its own performance. Now I'm going to talk about three of our efforts under this program. The first is lifelong learning for perception, and then lifelong learning for acting intelligently in the environment, and then the integration of perception and action together for robotics. First, I'm going to focus on our work on lifelong deep learning for perception. We've taken that lifelong machine learning framework that I described before and implemented lifelong deep learning using it. In this case, we're evaluating lifelong deep learning on object recognition using two data sets, CIFAR 100 and a more challenging data set called Office Home that includes product images with clean backgrounds that you might say see in an online store, as well as real world images of those same products on complex and cluttered backgrounds. As you can see, our lifelong deep learning methods either perform significantly better than other approaches or perform comparably, but with significant speed up depending on the data set. Now let's look at the dynamic behavior of lifelong learning. The left shows a standard multitask convolutional neural network, and our lifelong learner is on the right. When I start with task one and we learn that task, performance naturally goes up. Look at the multitask learner on the left. As it encounters task two, notice the performance for task one took a hit as we learned task two. There's some interference in the knowledge that we've learned on task two that decreases the performance of the multitask learners uh, ability to perform task one. This is an example of catastrophic forgetting, which is common if we say take a transfer-based algorithm that's not designed for lifelong learning and apply it to a lifelong learning setting. In contrast, our lifelong learning approach on the right is able to maintain performance on each task as the tasks are learned consecutively. In this way, it successfully avoids catastrophic forgetting. Notice also that lifelong learning performance improves over time, showing that the lifelong learner is able to build on top of its previously learned knowledge to improve each consecutive task. The next approach I'm going to talk about is a lifelong learning version of policy gradient reinforcement learning, which is designed for acting in an environment. In this case, we've applied it to a simulated Sawyer robotic arm, where the robot arm has to perform a number of different tasks consecutively. The left video on each task is our lifelong learner, and the right video is traditional machine learning uh, using single task learning. For example, task zero might be to move to a specific position and then use a hammer and then operate a door lock and then move a basketball into a hoop and then open a window and then finally operate a coffee maker as the final task. I'm going to pick on the coffee maker. Notice that the robot arm needs to push a button as well as slide a cup under the coffee maker. The lifelong machine learner is able to successfully do this by rapidly building upon its previous knowledge, while single task learning fails and knocks over the coffee cup due to insufficient training. 
To evaluate our developed lifelong learning methods, we're integrating them together into an application to autonomous service robots. Our goal was to have the robots continually deployed in our universities performing what we're calling a scavenger hunt, where they have to perform a diverse variety of tasks over time. These are tasks that you might, say, encounter in an office environment or a home care situation. Things like recognize a lamp or find a set of missing keys or retrieve a pill bottle from the kitchen or model the relationships among objects within the environment to answer questions about it. Escort a visitor from the lobby to an office or intelligently interact with people in the world. These are collaborations between all the universities on our team, including the University of Pennsylvania, UT Austin, Brown University, UMass Amherst, the University of Michigan, and the University of Southern California. This is an example of work done at UT Austin on this application. In this scenario, the robot's task is to locate a book. You can see that the robot moves through the house looking for features of the environment that give it clues as to where to look. From its experience on other tasks, the robot knows that books are related to shelves, and so it sees features of the bookshelf from a distance, recognizes uh, it in a relationship to other living room furniture, and then uses that information to navigate closer and look for the book, eventually solving the task. Here's an example of our robot performing the scavenger hunt on a much broader set of tasks at UT Austin. We built a website interface that allows users to create particular tasks for the robot. In this case, to find a number of different objects. The robot is then sent uh, out into the environment to perform these tasks. The robot moves through the environment to a location where it believes that the objects may be located based on its learned knowledge and percepts, and then surveys the area searching for the object. It then uses its learned perception models to recognize a number of different objects in the world. Once it locates the target object, it then records evidence that it has succeeded and then tags that object on the map. As the robot experiences more tasks over its lifetime, its learned object recognition models will be improving through lifelong learning. It will also learn to model the relationships among different objects over time, such as that chairs are commonly located near tables. This enables it to model the distribution of objects in its environment to improve search. It can then use this knowledge to complete new tasks or to intelligently explore its environment. With each consecutive task, the robot's ability to perceive and act in the environment will improve due to lifelong learning, enabling it to solve a diverse variety of tasks while continually deployed in the environment. Thank you very much for your attention. And now, DARPA, Microsystems Technology Office Program Manager, Dr. Ali Kashavarzi. I would like to talk to you about ferroelectronics and some foundational capabilities to enable edge intelligence. My talk focuses on computing problem for embedded intelligence that requires localized processing. We want to see the world, sense it, and react to it quickly. Today, we rely on a communication-centric central approach. In fact, central approach is not new. If you look at the eras of the computing over the past several decades, uh, we have several uh, cycles that is started with the mainframes and large centrally located computers using dumb terminals to connect to them. Then came the era of the PCs, laptops, and mobile devices. Currently, the cloud and computing in data centers uh, is uh, predominant. In the current approach, the data that is sensed gets communicated to a cloud, to the cloud. It gets processed there and the decisions come back to the devices in the field at the edge. Energy is fundamental limitation in this approach and for particularly data intensive applications. At the edge, we face even more challenges. Communication consumes all the energy. Consider sending data wirelessly with energy per bit that uh, has not really improved beyond nanojoule per bit. For example, in 5G's data rate of one gigabits per second, at nanojoule per bit, just shipping the data to the central location consumes one watt of power, which is way too much power. The solution is not scalable. The lack of scaling is due to the perfect storm that we're in. We know about Moore's law challenges, no Denard's scaling, issues with the von Neumann architecture, energy to move data is prohibitive, and I mentioned that communication energy stock is at nanojoule per bit and we do not have a new switch. So what is the solution in this challenging environment? The solution is edge intelligence. Edge intelligence takes compute to the data, uh, 
processing the data at its source, converting it into the information, which is more valuable bits, and reducing the data by factors of more than 10,000 times. That not only addresses the energy problem, it also relieves some of the burden from communication. However, edge intelligence needs a capable small processing engine that should deliver performance efficiently. This is because energy is scarce at the field, in the field. Plotting computing uh, performance in y-axis as a function of power shown in x-axis from larger numbers to the smaller numbers going right in the y-axis, showing also contours of uh, energy efficiency, uh, it shows that uh, industry is operating at 1 to 10 tops per watt efficiency, more closer to 1 tops per watt than 10 while delivering 1 to 100 uh, tops of performance, consuming powers in the range of tens of watt to 100 watt. We need 1,000x improvement, which is difficult task as shown by the arrow in our chart. This improvement will enable more varieties of computing vectors beyond the uh, perception class of problems that is widely being worked on toward autonomy in decision making. The key question is, how do we get 1,000 times improvement? For solutions, we may have to dive deep into technology and more foundational capabilities. For example, technologies for doing in-memory computing in new data flow architectures with the energy profile uh, of ferroelectric-based devices integrated in bleeding edge advanced technology nodes, blurring the boundary of logic and memory with dense memory compute elements in concert with SRAM and transistors of the advanced uh, technologies. Early research results show a path to 65x improvement, still short of 1,000 times x goal. Need more research, so ferroelectronics and foundational capabilities will be critical to realize the vision of edge intelligence. This will be indeed hard and challenging. Let's stay engaged and research uh, and work toward research, marching toward improving computing efficiency and density. Just imagine a world with such computing capability available to us in the field and at the edge. Looking forward to interacting with you. Thank you. Closing out this plenary session, DARPA, Microsystems Technology Office Program Manager, Dr. Brian Jacobs. Good morning. Today I'm going to talk about hybrid computing architectures. And by hybrid, what I really mean is introducing nonlinear analog dynamical systems into what we would normally think of as conventional digital electronics. Why are we interested in doing this? Well, there are several very important problems where it simply takes too much energy in order to compute a solution for a problem of mission scale relevance. So some examples are shown here on this slide, uh, which range from complex attack planning to sensor placement to electronic circuit design and testing. One of, the, one of the sensor placement problems that I find particularly interesting is a relatively simple to write down problem of where's the best place to put nuclear sensors to, to detect smuggling. It turns out it's very, with all of these problems, it's very easy to write down the relationships as graphical equations. However, the number of combinations of possible solutions makes it infeasible to, to find solutions in general. And it's clear because of the problem scaling that we need something other than just more efficient classical computing. We need uh, something beyond more flops per watt. So um, we need a fundamentally different way of solving these problems. Some people think that quantum computing is the only way of uh, attacking this kind of problem. However, it's not actually clear that quantum computers will ever be able to solve these problems efficiently because there's an overhead associated with going quantum, um, certainly not in the short term. So that doesn't mean we can't draw inspiration from quantum techniques in order to solve these kinds of problems more efficiently. One of the problems that we've looked at um, in particular is this notion of developing test vectors for electronic circuits. 
So many of you probably know that it is infeasible to run every possible input into a circuit to make sure that it was manufactured uh, with 100% fidelity. So we want to not only look for defects, but look for things that uh, additional features that might have been placed in our circuits. So what we can see from uh, this chart is the amount of energy that's required to develop efficient test vectors um, for even small circuits. And as you can see, it scales uh, so badly that if we want it to attack or, or to uh, develop test vectors for an advanced encryption circuit, then it could take a 10 megawatt superconducting supercomputing facility several days in order to generate our test vectors. In analyzing this and considering quantum-inspired techniques, which currently run as digital simulations of quantum systems, or of just even some classical systems, we can see, uh, we can expect a three order of magnitude advantage to this type of uh, problem solving technique. So that means in a day, in a rack of equipments, we might be able to do what it takes a 10 megawatt facility to do in several days. So how do we envision doing this? Well, as I mentioned, a lot of state-of-the-art algorithms currently simulate classical analog systems. And we ask the question of, what if we brought those analog dynamics into a digital architecture so that we could get the best of both worlds and mimic these quantum interactions in classical hardware? So there are a large number of variables that we need to consider and optimize in order to make this work. Uh, one way of looking at this is we want to tailor the hardware to accelerate these quantum-inspired algorithms. And now the nature of the nonlinear dynamics that we are researching suggests that they are portable across most computing platforms. So the obvious question becomes, which platform will provide the most benefit? Some of these quantum-inspired techniques have already been demonstrated in semiconductor uh, technologies and in the optical domain. So in addition to just figuring out which platform is best, we need to develop new algorithms, which will probably incorporate some form of problem decomposition so that a big problem can be solved using smaller clusters of these uh, coupled dynamical systems. In addition to that, we'll need to develop advanced control, analog control techniques. And in order to simulate these kinds of systems at higher levels, we'll need high fidelity modeling to, to make scalable simulations. Thank you very much. Have a good day. This concludes our morning plenary session. Join us in the exhibit hall to view posters and demonstrations. Parallel sessions and workshops will begin at 2.15 PM Eastern Time.